Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. As many of you know, the GeForce RTX 3080 reviews are almost here, and I'm one step closer to updating all my GPU data for almost two dozen current and previous generation products. So that is a bit of a relief. Anyway, recently I've been talking quite a bit about the RTX 2080 and how I feel it failed to replace the GTX 1080 Ti in any meaningful way. Now, despite only comparing the Turing and Pascal GPUs in that content, I did notice that quite a few people in the comment section took that to mean that I thought AMD's similarly priced Radeon 7 was just a better product. Again, despite never actually mentioning it once. Fact is, I've never really been that fond of the Radeon 7. Our day one review wasn't particularly positive, and much the same can be said about all of our follow-up content to date. Now, before we get on to talking about the Radeon 7 and what I've said in the past, Today's video is sponsored by ASUS and their brand new range of ROG Strix B550 motherboards, many of which we've already tested here at Harbour Unboxed and found to deliver excellent VRM thermal performance. And whatever your needs, ASUS has an ROG Strix B550 motherboard for you, all of which come with a range of AI features such as AI networking, AI noise cancellation technology and AI overclocking. The B550F Gaming is a particular favourite of mine as it's competitively priced and delivers a strong feature set including a high quality VRM. So for more information please check the link in the video description. Okay so AMD announced the Radeon 7 at CES 2019 and in my opinion it wasn't really met with a lot of fanfare as everyone, myself included, were expecting a GPU based on what was at the time AMD's upcoming architecture codenamed Navi. In other words, a repurposed compute GPU based on an older GCN 5th gen architecture wasn't exactly what gamers wanted, even if it was produced using TSMC's 7 nanometer process. Still, despite featuring the same architecture as Vega 56 and 64, which let's be honest was never a smashing success, the move from Global Foundry's 14 nanometer process to TSMC's 7 nanometer FinFET process allowed AMD to shrink the die size by 32%, while also stuffing in 6% more transistors. As a gaming product, the Radeon 7 should have technically been called Vega 60, if we were to go off the Radeon RX Vega series naming, but that would have been very confusing and quite silly given that it is faster than Vega 64. Still, what we got was 60 compute units for a total of 3,840 stream processors, so 6% fewer stream processors than Vega 64. However, the cores were clocked at least 13% higher, but by far the biggest upgrade was made to the memory as the Radeon 7 packed an insane 16 gigabytes of VRAM. In addition to having as much memory on the graphics card as you'd find installed in most gaming systems DIMM slots, the Radeon 7 also got a massive 4096 bit wide memory bus, allowing for an insane 1 terabytes per second of memory bandwidth, double that of Vega 64. But as great as all that sounds, it is rather unnecessary for gaming and therefore made the product rather uneconomical. At the time, we suspected AMD would be making basically nothing from the Radeon 7 at the $700 price point, but that's also where they had to price it to compete with the RTX 2080 based on how the Radeon 7 performs. And this was a huge problem for AMD and their underperforming Radeon 7. It just cost too much to make and as a result was discontinued just six months after release. Availability though was never great to begin with, despite demand being very low. So it really did make sense to axe that part and then replace it with the Radeon RX 5700 series, which came to the rescue five months after the release of the Radeon 7. So it's no coincidence that just one month after the arrival of the 5700 XT, the Radeon 7 disappeared off shelves forever. Here's a bit of what I said when wrapping up my Radeon 7 review back in February of 2019. Another issue for the Radeon 7 will be availability. The retailers I've spoken to have said availability is much worse than we saw with the RTX 2080 Ti upon release. So while I suspect demand for this new Radeon GPU will be low, production still might be even lower. As it turned out, the information I received from retailers was bang on. Availability was still poor despite weak demand, at least from gamers. Anyway, I also went on to say, as such, I'm not sure if or when we will see custom AIB models. AMD has told me AIBs are free to develop their own models, but I suspect we'll see very few. We saw this with Vega. There just wasn't enough volume and demand to warrant the investment from board partners. Again, it appears that I was right on the money there with those comments. Zero AIB models for the Radeon 7 surfaced, and that left us with just AMD's own reference models, which were pretty hot and loud 
least in my opinion. So the demand must have been pretty horrible, or maybe it was the margins that were horrible. Either way, even key partners such as Sapphire gave the Radeon 7 a wide berth. Anyway, I finally went on to say, in the end, the Radeon 7 looks to be nothing more than a stopgap to the now heavily delayed Navi. It's a way for AMD to stick their hand up halfway and say, we're still here guys, don't forget about us. The only hope for the Radeon 7 now is that production costs will come down over the coming months, allowing them to edge it down towards $600. It's a big ask I know, and even there, it's only slightly better value than Vega 64 and the RTX 2080, while it's worse value than the RTX 2070. So in summary, the great graphics card depression continues, and unless you're looking at spending less than $200, the options available aren't that great in terms of value. AMD also needs a miracle with Navi. A lot's riding on that one, but given what they've achieved with Ryzen, I strongly believe anything is possible at this point. <laughs> and I guess today I sort of have to continue to believe that anything is possible, especially with AMD and Radeon. The 5700 series though, that was really quite good, at least up against an overpriced GeForce 20 series. Anyway, moving on again, shortly after my Radeon 7 review, I put together a mega benchmark comparing it with the RTX 2080, and in short, this is what I ended up saying. I simply cannot recommend the Radeon 7 over the GeForce RTX 2080, as badly as I want the RTX 2080 to be obliterated, forcing Nvidia to get real with their pricing, that hasn't happened. Therefore, gamers are forced to pay 2016 pricing for 2016 performance. Let's just hope and pray that things improve later in the year. So that was the end of the Radeon 7, quite literally the end of the Radeon 7. But it's now a year and a half later, we have newer, more demanding games. So does the Radeon 7 stack up any better against the RTX 2080? Well, today, of course, we're gonna find out. Once again, we'll be testing all three GPUs. That includes the 1080 Ti, the Radeon 7, and the RTX 2080 in our new Ryzen 9 3950X GPU test system, which does see no difference in performance at 1440p and 4K when compared to our 10900K test system. Starting with one of the most recently released AAA titles, Death Stranding, we see that the Radeon 7 trails even NVIDIA's previous generation GTX 1080 Ti even at the 4K resolution. Disappointingly, we find that the RTX 2080 is 18% faster at 1440p, which is a rather large margin, and then 22% faster at 4K with much more consistent performance. So again, very disappointing to see that from a GPU armed with 16 gigabytes of VRAM. Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 is another new title, and this super demanding simulator sees the RTX 2080 enjoying a rather large performance advantage at 1440p, though we do see virtually identical performance at 4K. Quite interestingly, last time I compared the RTX 2080 and Radeon 7 and Shell of the Tomb Raider, they were very neck and neck with the GeForce GPU enjoying at most a 7% performance advantage. Since then, I've changed from using SMAA to TAA, and I'm not quite sure how much of an influence that has on the results. Plus, in addition to that, we've seen a few game updates and of course, a number of driver updates as well, and even changes to Windows itself. But the end result now being a 15% performance advantage in favor of the RTX 2080 at 1440p. The Radeon 7 does compete very well in Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege. Here it basically matched the RTX 2080 at all three tested resolutions, so a decent result there. The performance margins in F1 2020 were also quite small, though the RTX 2080 does still enjoy a small performance advantage while the Radeon 7 and GTX 1080 Ti mix it up at 4K and 1440p. Next up we have Gears 5, and here we're looking at pretty mediocre performance from the Radeon 7, as the RTX 2080 delivered 9% more frames at 1440p and 15% more at 4K, while both were actually slower than the Pascal-based GTX 1080 Ti. So in short, a very disappointing result here for what's technically the newest GPU in the Radeon 7. The Radeon 7 was competitive in Horizon Zero Dawn, just falling short of the RTX 2080 at 1440p and 4K, so a reasonable result given they both cost $700 when available. But again, the Radeon GPU did arrive later, and therefore really needed to offer something more. Performance across the board was virtually identical in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, so another decent result for the Radeon 7, despite not really being able to offer anything extra at the $700 price point. 
The Radeon 7 does nudge ahead by a very small margin in World War Z, boosting performance by 4.5% at 1440p and then 3% at 4K. It's not nothing, but it's also not really a noteworthy gain either, so let's just move on. Here we see when testing with Metro Exodus that the Radeon 7 is again quite competitive, but ultimately it is the GeForce RTX 2080 that delivered the best results, boosting performance at 1440p by an 8% margin and 7% at 4K. The Resident Evil 3 results are very neck and neck, though the Radeon 7 does suffer slightly weaker frame time performance at 1080p and 1440p. Despite that though, there's not really much else to talk about here. Doom Eternal does thankfully provide us with some interesting results. At 1080p, the Radeon 7 is a bit slower than the GTX 1080 Ti and quite a bit slower than the RTX 2080. Similar margins are also seen at 1440p, though here the Radeon 7 is able to just edge ahead of the 1080 Ti. Then at 4K we see a complete reversal of the 1080p results, with the Radeon 7 beating the GTX 1080 Ti by a 9% margin and the RTX 2080 by a 22% margin. Clearly the extra memory bandwidth and memory capacity is playing an important role in this VRAM heavy title when using the Ultra Nightmare quality preset. The Radeon 7 is a lot less impressive in Wolfenstein Youngblood. Here it gets smashed at 1080p with poor 1% low performance, and even the results at 1440p aren't great with up to 36% stronger 1% low performance seen with the RTX 2080. And even at 4K, the Radeon 7 just fails to impress with the Turing-based GPU providing 22% more performance when comparing the average frame rates. Last up, we have Hitman 2, and here we have another title where the Radeon 7 can't even match the RTX 2080, let alone beat it. At 1440p, the GeForce GPUs, as in both the RTX 2080 and GTX 1080 Ti, beat the Radeon 7 by a 16% margin and were also 11% faster at 4K. So here we are ending on another disappointing result for AMD's shortest lived GPU ever. As we've come to expect from the Radeon 7, performance is fairly inconsistent when compared to competing parts such as the GeForce RTX 2080 Ti, and really even the old GTX 1080 Ti. That said, let's take a look at the average performance across the 14 games tested to get a clearer picture of how they really do compare. With the inconsistent performance seen in a few of the games tested now smoothed out, we find that overall the Radeon 7 is basically on par with the old GeForce GTX 1080 Ti at all three tested resolutions. Given that the 1080 Ti was released roughly two years prior for the same $700 mind you on TSMC's inferior 16 nanometer FinFET process, that is a pretty horrible result for AMD. On average, the RTX 2080 was 8% faster at 1440p, and 5% faster at 4K. Not exactly big margins, and overall I'd say the 4K experience was very much the same, but again, the Radeon 7 was late to the party, and as such, it really did need to offer something new, something extra, and it just failed to do that. Sure, 16 gigabytes of VRAM is nice and all, but unfortunately games just don't need that much. Not then, and still not now. Moreover, availability was weak, and with no quality AIB models to speak of, it simply couldn't compete with the RTX 2080. Well, no surprises there really. The Radeon 7 was 8% slower last time out when we compared it to the RTX 2080 about a year and a half ago now. And today it's still 8% slower on average at 1440p. Granted, it is a dead product at this point, and it has been for about a year now, but many of you were interested to see how it compared to the RTX 2080 in late 2020, and now you have your answer. That said, I don't doubt that at some point in the future, the Radeon 7 will actually crush the RTX 2080 at high resolution gaming, thanks to having twice as much VRAM. But I also suspect by the time that happens, you won't want to be gaming with either product, so it's probably not worth worrying about or really even talking about. In the end though, the Radeon 7 really was inferior to the RTX 2080 for gaming and ultimately uh, really shown up by the much older GTX 1080 Ti, which is why AMD has had so much catching up to do or still has so much catching up to do. So it'll be very interesting to see what they have for us in the coming months. A lot of, uh, again, hype probably surrounding those big Navi products. I have really no expectations at this point, so I'm just gonna wait till we have them in the lab and we're running our benchmarks to see how those cards stack up to, of course, the, 
The GeForce 30 series, which we'll have before then, they'll be coming up on the channel very soon, very, very soon at this point. You guys know the release date and the reviews will be up just before then. So make sure you are subscribed for that content because you are not going to want to miss that benchmark video. And that is going to do it for this one. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, if you appreciate all this updated benchmarking that we do, then you can uh, join us over on Patreon. You can support our work directly that way. And you can also get some really cool perks in return, such as live streams that Tim and I do each month for Patreon members. So just there'll be a, a select amount of people in the live chat that are Patreon members. It won't be some big spammed chat that you would see on the main channel. We also have a private Discord chat as well, where you can chat in there daily, nightly, whenever you want to jump in there. Q&As, behind the scenes videos, it's pretty cool. Links in the video description if you're interested. But other than that, thank you very much for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.